in this very beach laying down enjoying the, the sunsets without a care in the world and then the man lying on the beach the fisherman looks up at the businessman smile on his face well sir what do you think I'm doing right now friends as we go about our lives we're working or we're doing things we have to wonder what do not to miss what we already have right here with us so I'm thankful for Sabbath it's those moments where we can, this day, we can get rid of the distractions and reflect and appreciate what we do have. So once again, welcome to Monterey Bay Academy Church, where land and sea unite to inspire. Um, a couple announcements for today um, are at 4 p.m. today, and it's in, if you, I got a little bulletin paper there back on the, uh, on the desk in the lobby. And it just says what I'm about to tell you, the conference era meeting arise and go um, several places uh, will have will have those meetings. So I'm not sure. Is it is it for anybody? All right. Any anybody can come. It's kind of like instructional um, from what I've seen a little bit of it. So it looks really good. Arise and go at 4 p.m. Uh, about four to six if you're budgeting time. So I invite you to um, to go to that if you're so inclined here uh, here in the church in the various rooms and places all right um so once again welcome we will be having oh i almost forgot there's what i did forget there's a pot thank you for reminding me potluck today after uh after the services so if you brought at four oh room four <laughs> right room four potluck that's the one over there the farthest one right yeah the farthest one the end one where if you're here it's the women's ministries uh, class. So potluck at four, uh, potluck room four after church, and at four, arise and go uh, conference area meetings. Um, so you're welcome to any of those to come and share. Now, we have a mission spotlight, I believe. It's titled Terrific Tuesdays, Adra's Work, and I think it is in, well, there'll be some maps you could see. I'm told it's in New Zealand, uh, if you hear the accents, maybe you can also come to that conclusion, but there's a map that leaves no doubt to where it's from. So, Mission Spotlight. Tuesday, we have what's called a kids program. We start off with a, um, a meal for the kids because they're coming hungry. Um, after that, we have student activities set up for them, and the kids just love, love being kids.
But the project was not always like that. It started in a very simple way. Some years ago, before we started this program, our church was like a theological museum, just um, in the street, but not part of the street. And we needed a way to be able to connect with that community and bring those two groups of people together. And we want to mix, get to know each other, and spend time together. And so that's been the flavour of our community meal program. Bringing them into the community was, um, it was good for them and it was good for me to see because yeah, I love watching them play with other kids and get to know other kids and do all the activities and like be proud of themselves. Like, oh mum, did you see? Like, I coloured this and I was pink and I won, you know? And I'm like, oh cool. The whole family environment here is so very welcoming. That's something that we have, that I have really noticed about being here and you just feel part of the family. And that's kind of what it is, it's just a big family. The Kaitaia Community Project, as the name suggests, is for the community. Not only are children and their families being affected, but those involved are being touched by this movement as well. Like Brian, who came to town looking just for a home, but he found much more than that. I saw the notice outside saying a community meal, and I heard that it was a vegetarian meal. I like vegetarian food. So I came in and it was, seemed really good. Every Tuesday evening there's a children's group and in the children's group the children are nourished by both body and soul. I get hugs from the children sometimes and I love that. This whole project wouldn't be possible without the special support of ADRA New Zealand. ADRA is the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. We are the humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and um, effectively we have uh, international projects where we help families or communities in need. And then here in New Zealand specifically, we uh, look at some of the needs that there are throughout our communities and through our churches, we um, then meet some of those needs through the community initiatives that we have. Kaitaia Church is doing an amazing job and Adra loves working with Kaitaia Church because of the impact that they're having in their local community. And for us, it's about reaching um, as many people as we can and helping as many families um, in the community to thrive. So by partnering with Kaitaia, we're able to maximize the impact that they have in their community. The process is this, that as they come in and they feel the love that we have for them and the concern that we have for them as people, and the fact that they're coming into a safe place and they enjoy their Tuesdays, that they will want more of this. Willing hearts, open minds, anything is possible. And um, with God, of course, that is exactly what happened. And then so I came back on Saturday uh, to the church and uh, I really enjoyed it because I'd never been to um, a, church, a Christian service in my whole life before. I loved the project and my kids loved the project and I loved the church so I started bringing them on Saturday. Simple gestures like these are the things that actually connect us at a much deeper level. They show us that kindness can overcome indifference, that life is precious and most importantly not only can we hope for a better future but we can help make it happen. You can be a change maker in your community as well. Just find your local Seventh Day Adventist Church or get in touch with the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, to see how you can make it a reality. Now, it's really cool seeing that we're not just one little local community, we're a worldwide family, actually. Um, so that's really neat. Uh, for offering, I believe we'll have our, um, our little offering plate in the back. So if you have any loose offering, just know it goes to our, um, our local church budget to help pay for the needs of our immediate um, building here, whatever bills and repairs and necessities we have. Um, so after church, you can Put it in the offering plate there. If you have your Bibles, though, I'll invite you to open up your Bibles to our scripture for the morning. 
um, for our, our scripture reading in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. Once again, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I will be reading out of the New King James Version. I believe behind me will be the New International Version, as that same version is what's in the Bibles and the pews in front of you. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads and I'll lead us out in a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this Sabbath. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that we woke up to the rainfall, Lord. Uh, it always reminds us that the earth is being refreshed and renewed. Uh, thank you for Donna. Bless her mightily as she shares your word, Lord. Let your words be in her mouth. Help us to learn the lesson you would have us learn. Stay with each one of us. You know our situations. You know our trials, our temptations, our fears, our triumphs. So please stay with us in all our needs, but also in our rejoicing as well. Help us to have a great Sabbath, Lord, to connect with you and with each other. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. sort of carrying a conversation without coughing much than we were last week, so I'm really counting on y'all to see. There we go. So uh, our first song is going to be a hymnal for uh, 229, I'll Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We'll do, um, well, I have three verses. I don't remember how many is actually in the hymnal, but I have three in front of me. I'll hail the power, let every candidate and oh that with yonder sacred throng. I'll hail the power. And again, thinking about home, it, uh, for the theme for the for the month, uh, welcoming home, going home, coming home, all of those things. So this song is always, I always think of that because I'm thinking this is a triumphal entry song heading home. So.
just choose instruments sometimes based on what I think of the song or how I remember it from my childhood. And this one is uh, much more influenced by recall of my mother's family. So the mandolin or guitar was, or banjo or, or banjo would come out. So that one I always think of brass in my head and I, and, you know, I always hear all hail the power with trumpets and trombones and French horns and, and um, that's what was playing in my head, whether you heard it or not. Anyway, but on this one, when the roll is called up yonder, number 216, when the roll is called up yonder, um, I, I hear my aunts and my uncles singing and playing, and this one, again, makes me think of home. Not just because of family home, but also eternity. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up Now this next one you you may not know. This is an old gospel hymn. Um, its pace will change a little bit, but I want to teach you because um, thinking about this uh, month, this song is called "Going Home." Um, that's the name of this song, and um, this again is an old uh, family um, one. Um, I had a, uh, a grandfather who was in uh, a quartet. The song. So, um, part of a band that I was part of, we recorded this one uh, years ago. So I'm gonna teach it to you. Now you'll you'll understand its meaning. But there's a it's a really easy part where you can echo, right? You'll see this. See, going home, we will go home. So, what you're going to, to see is something like, um, and I'll, I'll sing through the, the part of it. Um, so it's real easy kind of melody line because that's what they would have done in the 18. 70s or whatever, whenever this song, I think, was originally written. But it, it goes kind of like this. So you have um, the verse goes, and, and then this echo is what's throughout. So I'm counting on you. All of my friends that I loved yesterday go and we will, see, uh, uh, going home, going home, but going home, we will go home, going home, we will go home, da 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 It just plays off the fourth both times, and that, that repeats. So, I will sing that part with you. I just was going to sing it. So, all of my friends that I loved yesterday, go and we will go home, go and we will go home. The songbirds that sing in the dell seem to say, go, we will go home, go and we will go home. See how that works? Kind of got that, right? So, I will try to do the first part if you can remember. But if, if you don't get it, I'll, I'll jump in there back and forth. I just tape it. So, that, so now, the, that's how every verse always has that sort of echo with it. The chorus is all together to tell the last line, which kind of 
allows it to split. And the way I hear it in my head also when I've done these like congregations through our well groups, I would hear I would hear my uncles and then my aunts do the echo. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's what I hear in my head. So um, okay, so what so the chorus goes more like this. We'll join the heavenly fold. We'll be walking the streets of pure gold. We'll all leave as one when our work here is done. Going home, we'll go home. Going, we will go home. See how that works? Okay. All right. So um, every verse has that sort of echo. And anyway. Um, sort of ready? You want to try one more time, sort of learn the part before I throw it at you? Because we're, we're going to learn this. It's, I, I just think it's a great song that we, you know, some of these get left behind because they're, they're not as up-tempo or whatever, but anyway, I think that, the, I think the lyrics are really, really, really good. So, let's, uh, we'll practice that sort of echo on verse 2. Life, life can be lonely, our time here a chore. Go and he will go home, go and he will go home. The old weeping willow that stands by the door. Sadly, we will go home, go, we will go home. We'll join the heavenly fold. We'll be walking the streets of pure gold. Or is Jason, are you just bored? Okay. All right, because this is literally, the tenor part is right up your alley. I'm, I'm literally thinking of that. It also need, has a good baritone part, but I can't do that. So, so you've got to just stuck with this. All right.
633 when we all get to heaven um, it's one of my mother's favorite and um, there's a probably a, most of it will be normal there might be a couple chords that are a little different I don't know it'll be what I remember playing because I don't tend to always focus on what's in front of me so I'm trying to keep my memory um, and I can't go in A7 there you'll probably notice when you go by uh, but anyway sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy and his grace Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that. Thank you. 
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. What a blessing it is to be here in the rain this morning as we were driving over the hill, just um, <clears throat> raining down upon us and reminding us of God's mercy in our lives and what he wants for each one of us. This morning, um, I'm happy to share with you uh, on our theme of going home. And my title is What's in the Pantry? And you won't really know what that has to do with it until the very end, but we'll start there. But our theme is, um, let's see if I can do this where it's supposed to work. All right, is coming home or going home or there's lots of different words that come to mind with that. And so I just ask that my words would be what God wants to have shared today. So with our theme of coming home this month, February, we've been, March, we've been talking about that, coming home and going home. I wanna ask you, when you hear those words, what comes to mind? If you're willing to share and just say it nice and loud, when you hear coming home or going home, what comes to mind for you? Cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls, ooh, I like that one. All right, what about you, Timothy? Sleep. Okay, sounds like a typical high school student. Yes, sleep. All right. Dr. Rossi. You've been somewhere else where it's too hot or too cold and coming home. Yes, all right, to our wonderful weather, even when it rains. Well, I want to share a few pictures with you that come to mind for me or might come to mind for you when you hear the phrase coming home or going home. And we're going to talk about those two words a little bit. But it might be just simply coming to your house. Um, it might be a house you remember as a young child. It might be um, going to grandma's house. Um, there's different things that that can, that can bring up. Maybe it's just the reuniting of people that haven't seen each other for a while. And I can remember when I would come home from college or from living in Nebraska that my mom was always, and my dad, was so happy to see me. And as your kids get bigger and go off to college, I hear from some of you from time to time how you're excited when your kids are coming home. Um, maybe it's just getting to go to the beach. Maybe the beach is somewhere that has a special memory. And so when you're coming, when you're going home, when you go to the beach, you feel like you've returned home. Maybe it's just your bed. And so for Timothy, yes, getting to flop down and just sleep. Spring break, so I know you're probably enjoying some extra sleep uh, this week. Maybe it's food. I heard cinnamon rolls. Um, I can remember as a youngster, and even as I now in my own home, that when the time bake actually works on Sabbath and you walk in the house, and the smells of whatever was in the oven. Baked potatoes seem to always smell the best when you would come home after church and if the time bake worked. But maybe it's particular food at mom's house or dad's or with a group of people. Maybe it's a, a loved one who's been gone for a long time. You think of people in the military as they return home, whatever, or off to college, whatever it might be. For me growing up, a lot of times it was the entrance at Monterey Bay Academy. Having grown up here, whenever we came through those gates, I knew I was home. And I think back to um, when we would go places and return, often, and I don't know why we did this or how it became something that we would do, but we'd drive through the gates and inevitably my, I would take off my seatbelt because I was home. I was back on campus, roll down the window, yeah, in the early days, it was roll down the window and just take in and smell the air, the fresh air, the ocean air. And it was just, it, when I come back even to vi visit when I was living in Nebraska, it's like you drive on campus, take it all in, and I knew I was home. Another picture for students, and I think about when students are here, that this campus becomes a second home and for some of them, unfortunately, this is a better place for them as far as home than maybe the situation they come from. When I've been on senior survival trips, I've heard kids talk about how coming to MBA, they feel like they are at home. And that's, we want them to feel at home here. And so it can be different things for different people. A memory of mine of coming home was when my sister and I would get to go down to the beach together. 
and that signifies that we are at home. And lastly, a couple years ago, got the opportunity to move into a new home. So home took on a different meaning than what it had for many years, but it still is there. And so there's all these different aspects of going home or coming home, and what is the difference? So I wanna take a look and see what Webster says about coming and going. All right, coming is simply an act or instance of arriving. So you've been almost invited and you are arriving somewhere because somebody has invited you to come home. But your going is that you are actually going somewhere like you've left somewhere to go somewhere. And so there's not a lot of difference in those words, but I thought it was important for us to look at those two. All right, I have a story to share with you from Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace? And think of it as a modern day version of one of the texts that we will look at today. A young girl grows up in a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. I don't know if any of you know where that is at, but her parents are a bit old fashioned, tend to overact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, and oh, those short skirts. They ground her a few times and she sees inside, I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. And that night she acts on a plan that she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. And maybe some of you did this at some point in your life. You thought about, I can do it. I'm gonna run away. So she runs away. She has visited Detroit only once before. It was on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the Tigers play. Because newspapers in Traverse City report that there are lur the lurid details that the gangs and the drugs and the violence in downtown Detroit are, she concludes this is probably the last place her parents will look for her. Maybe they'll try California or Florida, but they would never think of looking in Detroit. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay, and he gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. And now she realizes that she was right all along. Her parents were keeping from her all that the world had to offer and all the fun that was out there. The good life continues for a month, two months, a year she even makes it to. The man with the big car she calls him boss teaches her a few things that men like. Since she's underage, the men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. She feels like she's living the life. And occasionally she thinks about her folks back home, but their lives now seem quite boring and she could hardly believe that she actually grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with the headline, have you seen this child? But by now she has blonde hair and with all the makeup and body piercing jewelry she wears, nobody would mistake her for a mere child. Besides, most of her friends are runaways and nobody squeals when you're in Detroit. After a year, the first sallow signs of illness appear and amazes her how fast the boss turns on her. These days, we can't mess around, he says, and before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She turns a couple of tricks here or there from night to night, but they really don't pay much. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside big department stores where the heat comes up. Now, sleeping is really a wrong word for a teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit, as you can never relax on your guard. Dark circles begin to form under her eyes, and her cough worsens. One night as she lies awake listening for footsteps, all of a sudden, everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. In fact, she feels like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty and she's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspaper she's piled atop her coat. Something jolts a synapse of memory and a single image fills her mind of May in Traverse City when a million cherry trees bloom at once and with her golden retriever dashing through the rows and rows of blossoming trees in chase of a tennis ball. God, why did I leave, she says to herself and pain stabs at her heart my dog back home eats better than I do. She's sobbing and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she really does want to go home. 
Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times. But on the third time, she finally decides to leave a message. Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City, Michigan. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are gone on a trip and they're out of town? Shouldn't she have maybe waited another day or so until she could talk to them and make a plan? And even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. So she, would ha she should have given them some time to overcome the shock. She's now realizing, whoops. Her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech she is preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologized to anyone in years. The bus has been driving now with the lights on because in Bay, as they get to Bay City and tiny snowflakes start to hit the pavement, rubbed worn by thousands of tires, and the asphalt steams up. She's forgotten how dark it gets out here when you're away from the city. A deer darts across the road and the bus swerves. Every so often she sees a billboard and a sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. And then she begins to think, what have I done? When the bus finally rolls into the station though, it's air brakes hissing in protest. The driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes folks, that's all we have here. 15 minutes, she says, to decide her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror, smooths her hair, and licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice. If they're there, will they be there? She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepares her for what she sees. There, in the concrete walls and plastic chairs of the bus terminal in Traverse City, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and even a great grandmother. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers and taped across the entire wall of the terminals a computer generated banner that reads, welcome home. Out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes like hot mercury and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry. I know, he interrupts her, hush, child. We've got no time for that, no time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. Now, what a beautiful welcome home. No judgment, just pure elation that their daughter had returned. And so as we think about going and coming home, and we want to take a few look, a look at a few different texts in the Bible that talk about going and coming home or even a reunion. So the first one we're going to look at is Revelation 3.11. Revelation 3.11 says, I am coming soon. Who is it? Christ is coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He is coming for us. In John 14.6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 14, 2, it says, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? He's going somewhere. Where? He's going to prepare a place for us. Genesis 28, 21, So that I return safely to my Father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And in Revelation 21, 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And in Isaiah 43, 5, do not be afraid for I am with you. I'm going to create a great reunion. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. And one of the most familiar texts that has to do with in stories about a coming home or reunion and the, we just read the modern day version of Luke 15, 11 to 32. 
which talks about the prodigal son. And he, as he left and went out, and then his father kept wondering where he was, but he wanted to go out and, and experience the world. And as time went on, the servants continued to work, the, older, the other son was there working. And you know, you think about um, what, that's, what the Bible talks about with the son doing, going out and just willowing everything away. And yet his father never gave up hope that he would return home, never. And I know that our Heavenly Father never gives up on any one of us. And as the story continues in the Bible, the, the son finally decided, you know what, back home is where I need to be. And so he, he goes home and the father greets him on the path and then robes him and wants him to be welcomed back home and for him to realize that everything that is there is still his. And granted, the other son was not so excited about this. He was out in the field and he's like, I have worked hard and I've been here the whole time and how are you treating me? And he says to his son, my child, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. We're all familiar with this story in the Bible and I know that it can, the different players in the story can evoke different emotions. But when I think about a coming home or a going home or a reunion, I think about Christ simply continually holding out his arms for each one of us every day. And at times we, we stray away and he always welcomes us back. We can be considered, pro each one of us can be a prodigal child at times. And during those times we stray away, we think about there's too many rules, there's too many boundaries, we don't wanna live according to this way or that way. But if we look at what God provides for us, he has the best plan for each one of us. And through all of this, God never leaves us. As time goes on, we end up finding that we too need a place of shelter. We become hungry, both physically and spiritually. And so the most important depiction of coming, a coming, going, or reunion, however you wanna think about it, would be in 1 Thessalonians, our verse for today, 4, 16 to 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The girl in Traverse City, Michigan, the prodigal son, and Christ's return, our return to truth and his return to bring us home. So our original title, What's in the Pantry? For me, when I was a kid going and I would leave and go to college or when I moved to Nebraska and even to this day when I go to Arizona to my mom's home, home is wherever my mom is. And for me, when I would go home, I inevitably would look at what's in the pantry. And then I knew I was home. And it really didn't matter what was in the pantry, but I knew that mom, knew, you know, I, as a kid, I learned where certain things got stored in the pantry. And so then you knew where to find them. Um, and so regardless of what picture you have of coming or going home, I hope that inevitably you will think of the picture of Christ's return for each one of us and to bring us and take us to heaven for the ultimate reunion. Never forget that God is ready for us to return home. Let's make sure that we are all ready to go home. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your promise and for your willingness to come to this earth for each and every single one of us to not only come and be with us, but to turn around and take us home for the ultimate reunion in heaven. May you continue to guide us in all that we do. Be with us throughout this coming week. Um, Lord, I ask that you be with the meetings that are happening this afternoon for the Area 3 um, training. Lord, may you continue to bless this campus and bless all who come here each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. May the sun shine and warm upon your face, the rain fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Happy Sabbath.